Welcome back to the next video in the Crazy Small CPU video series. Uh, where are we up to? We've got the data paths all wired up on the CPU and we're just starting on the address side of things. And this video we're going to look at how the program counter operates. I've actually done the wiring to get the program counter to actually act as a counter. What I haven't done yet is wire the address lines up from the outputs of the program counter up into the ROMs and also the lines that will bring the jump value back down to the program counter for when it will do jumping. So what we're going to do in this video is look at how the 74LS161 chips act both as counters and registers, and then we'll actually put it into operation and get it to count up from one or zero up to 255. We've already seen the 74LS161 being used as a four bit counter. And what we do there is we apply D0 to D3 inputs. Uh, to load it into the uh, register we have to drive PE low to do the load and then we have to wait for a rise in clock pulse and when the clock pulse goes high those values come into the register and then they appear out on the Q outputs. Well we've got a couple of extra uh, control lines MR, TC, CEP and CET so let's have a look and see how we can use those to build a counter with the 74LS161. So over on the data sheet, we know that the, if we drive PE low, it will load the inputs into the register. What we don't know is that if we leave PE high, then the chip actually acts as a counter. So how do we get it to count? Oh, before we get onto that, if we ever need to reset the value in the chip uh, back to zero, we can drive MR low, and that will reset the contents back to all zeros. Okay, so to make it act as a counter, we drive both CEP and CET high, and with both of them high, it actually acts as a counter. So with both of those high, and not resetting the chip, and not loading the chip, every time we get a clock pulse, the chip's values will go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which is all fine and good if you want to have a 4-bit counter, but we need an 8-bit counter, so we need to cascade two chips together. So to do that, we need a way of letting the high chip know when it's its turn to count uh, when the low chip reaches 15. Unfortunately, we've got a control line TC, and that goes high when the counter, bottom counter reaches all ones. So what we can do, knowing that both CEP and CET have to be high for a chip to count, we can set the low chip to have these two lines, CEP and CET high. It will count all the time. When it gets up to 15, TC goes high, we can wire TC up to one of those CEP or CET lines on the high chip, and until it gets to 15, that line stays low, that chip isn't going to be counting. When it gets to 15, it goes high, the top chip counts up another value, this one goes back to zero, and thus we get our cascaded 8-bit uh, counter. So if we go over to the schematic for the crazy small CPU version 2, that's exactly what we've got. We've got our clock signal coming in. Oh, by the way, these chips are now upside down. Uh, and the reason for that is that the outputs need to go onto the left-hand side because that's where the bits need to go into the ROMs. So it's easier just to have them uh, placed upside down on the breadboard. So we've got the clock pulse coming in. Um, we've got on the load chip, CET and CEP set high, so most of the time this thing is going to act as a counter. So it's going to count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and while it's counting, TC is low. And that means the top chip, its CEP line is low and it's not going to count. However, when this gets to 15, that line goes high. On the next clock pulse, the top chip will count up by 1, and the bottom chip will drop back down to 0 from 15. And then we take the four bits of output from the bottom and the four bits of output from the top and that becomes our program counter value that goes up to the ROM chips for them to choose which instruction to perform. Um, now of course that's all good but we want to make sure we can both act as a counter and also uh, jump to a location. So we've got a control line called PC increment. When it's high, PE on both chips stays high and both chips act as a counter. When PC increment goes low, 
these two go low and the chip now acts as a register which is loading values and we can apply an 8-bit 8 8 -bit input value into both of the chips and the chips will load those values. So if we ever need to jump to a specific instruction, we place the 8-bit jump value here and we drive PC increment low and then the program counter will jump change to that new 8-bit value. All right, so let's put this thing into action. I've got the two program counter chips wired up and you can see the TC to CET, CEP line. Uh, so we've got cascading going on. I've got the blue line here wired up to um, program enable. So that's acting as the PC into, uh, increment line. So while it's high, we will increment the chips. And when it goes low, it would take normally take the eight data bits uh, coming in and load them up as the jump value. I've also got the master reset line wired up. Um, now, in the schematic, that was always wired high, so uh, the chip was never going to be reset. But when you turn it on to begin with, if I just show you, it generally takes some random values. Uh, in this case, it's all ones. So it's always useful to actually be able to reset. So let's do that now and take it low and bring it high. And so we've now reset both of the chips to zero. All right, so uh, we've got our clock pulse ready to come in and we've got uh, CEP, CET wired high on the bottom one and we've got the cascade up to the top chip. So if I start producing some clock pulses, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and we've got a normal binary counter going on on the low chip. When we get up to 15, the TC line is now high uh, gets the top chip uh, prepared to count. The next clock pulse, that chip counts up. Uh, the TC line drops back to zero, so it won't count again. And of course, we go from 15 back down to zero. All right, so we've got a working program counter. And I'm not sure what's going to happen if I actually change the PC inc uh, increment line low. Uh, it'll probably drop the two chips to some random jump value. Uh, looks like it didn't do anything. That's interesting. But anyway, it should eventually work and load. Oh, we've got to load the chip, of course. So I've actually got to do that to load the chip with. And of course, the inputs are coming in are zero. Excellent. So we now have a working program counter. In the next video, I'll have um, the eight address wires uh, the eight program counter output wires loaded up to be addresses for the ROMs and we should start actually seeing some values come out on those ROMs.